Hello everyone, and welcome to War in Middle-Earth, a series where I take you through all of the major wars and conflicts throughout the history of Middle-Earth, from the First Age to the Fourth Age. In this episode, we look at the events that led up to the Battle of the Field of Calibrant, and the mighty battle itself. Often a forgotten battle, it was important for many reasons, but the greatest of those reasons was none other than the rise of the Kingdom of Rohan. In the previous episode, we looked at the fall of Arnor and of Angmar, and the end of the line of kings in Gondor. In fear of another kin strife and unable to find a close enough heir, it was decided that the stewards would rule Gondor until the king returned. The first of these ruling stewards was Mardil Voronwë of the House of Hurin, which rose to prominence during the reign of King Menardil and his successors Telemnar and Tarondor. Mardil himself is well known as the steward who advised King Aenor not to ride to Minas Morgul, a task that he eventually failed, although the blame cannot be put on him. Now, for Mardil, the early days of his reign probably weren't that optimistic. The Free Peoples had experienced something of a tumultuous last hundred years. Arnor and Ravanion were now gone, khazad had been abandoned by the Dwarves, many of the Galadrim had fled Lothlorien, Minas Ithil had fallen to the Nazgul, and now Gondor was kingless. However, things were actually about to get better. Fearing the growing power of this alleged necromancer that resided in Dol Guldur, a wizard known as Gandalf the Grey went to Dol Guldur to investigate in the year of 2063. Fearing discovery, the necromancer, who was none other than Sauron, abandoned Dol Guldur, which seemed to put a temporary halt to his plans. In the Morgul Vale and the accursed land of Mordor beyond, the Nazgul were silent. Even Gondor's old enemies like the Easterlings, Haradrim, and Corsairs were relatively peaceful. This was the beginning of the Watchful Peace. This was especially important for Gondor. They had taken the brunt of the fighting over the last few centuries, and now they finally had time to truly recover their strength. Let's talk about their situation a little more. The Great Plague and the wars that followed had devastated many of Gondor's provinces. Their power had shifted westward beyond the Anduin, and most of their territory east of the Anduin had been abandoned. With the fall of Minas Ithil, the people of Ithilien began to steadily migrate to safer lands. In Asgiliath, the ancient capital was still inhabited, but large sections of the city were in ruins and said to be haunted, although these are just rumours. In the north, the province of Anadwave had been entirely abandoned, and the province of Kalanadon, whilst geographically important, was only sparsely inhabited. In the south, Gondor had lost control of Harondor, and that region was now contested between it and the peoples of Harad. This watchful peace lasted for the most part of 400 years, encompassing the reigns of nine of Gondor's stewards. Eridan, Herion, Belagorn, Hurin I, Turin I, Hador, Barahir, and Dior. The 10th steward, Denifor I, had a mostly peaceful reign, but in the year of 2460, Sauron returns to Dol Guldur, still under the alias of the Necromancer. He's been busy the last few centuries, solidifying his hold over the men of the East and South, but he still isn't ready to reveal himself. However, the wise are still aware of the threat that this necromancer poses. After all, his name is the Necromancer, that's not really a nice, friendly name. So in the year 2463, they form the White Council, headed by Saruman. After 15 years, in 2475, Sauron feels his position is secure and puts his plans into action. Middle-earth once again erupts into warfare. An army bursts out of Mordor and attacks Gondor. This army consists of Uruks, a new breed of orcs that are taller, stronger, and more intelligent than normal orcs. Unlike normal orcs, they are resistant to sunlight, being able to travel during day or in the open without being disorientated or weakened. The strength of this new breed, coupled with the element of surprise, allows them to overrun Athelion and even capture Rosgiliath destroying Osgiliath's Great Stone Bridge in the process. Denifor I is an old man by this point, but his son, Boromir I, is a great captain of men, so much so that even the Witch King fears him. Despite Gondor's initial losses, Boromir is able to reverse their fortunes, recapturing Osgiliath and eventually Aphelion. This is not without consequence though, the last civilian inhabitants of Osgiliath flee, as do many of the remaining inhabitants of Aphelion. Furthermore, Boromir receives a Morgul wound during this war, and although he survives it, it leaves him crippled and weakened. Denifor dies in 2477, aged 102, and Boromir follows him to the grave a mere 12 years later, dying at the young age of 79. Well, young for one of the Dúnedain, that is. Boromir is succeeded by Kirion, who has a mammoth task ahead of him. The war with Mordor continues, although not at the same intensity that his father and grandfather experienced. In the south, Corsairs have begun harassing Gondor's coastlines, but in the north is where Kirion's true concern lies. 
The lands east of the Anduin had been abandoned following the wars with the Wayne Riders, and although the Wayne Riders had been defeated, Easterlings did not entirely depart that land. In the years following Sauron's return, more and more Easterlings began to pour in from the lands beyond the Sea of Rune, occupying the lands east and south of Mirkwood. The few Northmen that remained in those lands were either driven off, enslaved, or destroyed. But not satisfied with just that, these Easterlings began to raid up the eastern banks of the Anduin, eventually depopulating the lands as far north as the Gladden Fields. Through his reign, Kirion kept watch on these Easterlings, now called the Balkoth. Worth mentioning that Balkoth is a combining of Westron and Sindarin, which creates the term Horrible Horde, so these Easterlings probably didn't call themselves the Balkoth. Kyrian remanned the forts at the Undeep with a few men, and was content on scouting out the movements of the Balkoth for a time, but this changed in 2509. The Balkoth were now mustering at Mirkwood's southern eaves, building boats and rafts, intending on crossing the Anduin. They were not well armed and had few horses, but if Gondor's scouts were to be believed, they were incredibly numerous. Kyrion now had a crisis on his hands. The lands of Kalanadon were only sparsely populated and likely economically unimportant, but if an enemy was to take those lands, it would leave them on the other side of the Anduin, and it would open up Gondor's entire northern flank. And with enemy activity in Mordor and along Gondor's southern coasts, Kyrion realised he could not take Gondor's full strength north. Only the northern army could be committed to such a campaign, whereas the southern army must stay behind and defend. And if you remember the disaster at the Moranon, Gondor's northern army didn't perform too well against Easterlings anymore. In desperation, Kyrion's forts now turned to the Aethiod. Following the destruction of Angmar over 500 years earlier, the Aethiod had migrated north, dwelling in the lands of the Upper Vale of Anduin, where they had grown numerous, almost too numerous for the lands they inhabited. Gondor had maintained limited contact with their ancient allies, enough to know that their new leader, Aeol, had succeeded his father, Laod, at the mere age of 16. But the distance between Minas Tirith and the Aethiod capital at Framsburg was almost a thousand miles, and if messengers were to be sent, they would have to travel through the lower vales of Anduin, much of which was controlled or at least patrolled by orcs or Easterlings. And even if those messengers did arrive, there was no guarantee that the Aethiod would help. Taking volunteers, Kyrion ultimately chose six men to carry his messages, each travelling in a pair. The first pair was sent north on the 10th of March, in the year of 2510 and from this pair was the only man to succeed in his mission. Borendir, a man of Northman descent and a brilliant rider, arrived at Framsburg on the 25th of March, alone of all the six riders that left. His partner had been slain by arrows during an ambush near Mirkwood, and the other four riders never reached their destination. Upon reading the message, Aeol took counsel with himself, but made his decision that same day. The Aethiod would ride to Gondor's aid. He decided nothing less than the Aethiod's full strength would suffice, and by the 6th of April, this army was mustered. 7,000 riders and several hundred horsed archers. Only a few men of fighting capability would be left behind. With Borondir as its guide, this army began the near 500 mile ride to Kalanadon, following Anduin's eastern bank. Men of both good and evil heart fled at the sight of the army, those lands not having witnessed an army of such size in many, many years. As they passed Lothlorien, a mist enshrouded them, and although it allowed them to see clearly, it hid their presence from any enemies that might be watching. By the 15th of April, they had reached the Undeeps and crossed the Anduin. Our attention turns back now to Kyrion and his army. Shortly after the messengers departed, Kyrion rallied his northern army and marched north into Kalanadon. Even as he arrived, the Balkoth had crossed the Anduin, making short work of the defences at the Undeeps, and had started raiding deep into Kalanadon. However, Kyrion's arrival drew their horde together, and they gave battle on the plains of the Wold, likely sometime after the 10th of April. Due to the Balkoth's numerical superiority, Kyrion's army was driven northward, cut off from the south. They were driven over the river Limlight, and perhaps only avoided disaster due to the fact that a bridge had been constructed there during Gondor's ancient days. The Balkoth pursued them, crossing into the fields of Celebrant, the narrow strip of land between the Limlight and the Anduin. Yet, even as Gondor retreated, they were suddenly assailed in the rear by a new force, this time an army of orcs from the Misty Mountains. Whether this was planned by the Balkoth or by pure chance, Gondor was now pinned between two enemy armies, and was now being driven back towards the River Anduin. Unless a miracle arrived soon, Gondor's northern army would be driven into the Anduin and utterly destroyed. And that miracle came. Later on the 15th of April, 
The Aetheoid had crossed the Limlight. Seeing the battle occurring, they had looped north behind the Orcs of the Misty Mountains. Out of sight and totally unexpected, they fell upon the rear of the enemy, completely shattering the Orcs and forcing the Balkoff into a retreat over the Limlight. Shortly after escaping into the Wall, the Balkoff army shattered. Having little horsemen of their own and being deathly afraid of Aeol and his army, descendants of the same people that their ancestors had hunted to near extinction. Far over the plains of Kalinardon, the Aetheoid hunted down the Balkoff, and in the days that followed, Gondor's invaders were no more. Unfortunately, not all got to witness that victory, as Borondir was slain in that battle, defending his Lord Kirion to the very end. Gondor's battered army began its march south. Aeol accompanied them with a single Aored, around 120 men, but at the Mering stream, Kirion bade him farewell, informing him that they would return to this spot in three months for further discussions. Aeol did this, and in the three months that followed, he and his men remained in Kalinadon, ensuring that the Balkov did not return. Kirion, a wise man, kept his forts concealed, leaving many wondering in which way he would reward the Aetheoid for their faithfulness. Finally, in August, the two men met again, and Kirion, Aeol, and several others, including Halas, Kirion's son, and the Lord of Dol Amroth, passed through the Whispering Wood, ascending to the hallowed hill of Amon Anwar. There, beneath the tomb of Elendil himself, Kirion announced his reward. I will now declare what I have resolved, with the authority of the stewards of the kings, to offer to Aeol, son of Laod, lord of the Aetheod, in recognition of the valour of his people, and of the help beyond hope that he brought to Gondor in time of dire need. To Aeol I will give in free gift all the great land of Kalinardon, from Anduin to Aizen. There, if he will, he shall be king, and his heirs after him, and his people shall dwell in freedom while the authority of the stewards endures, until the great king returns. No bond shall be laid upon them other than their own laws and will, save in this. They shall live in perpetual friendship with Gondor and its enemies shall be their enemies while both realms endure, but the same bond shall be laid also on the people of Gondor. Aeol was stunned by the generosity of the steward, and graciously accepted. He took an oath in response, the famous oath of Aeol. Hear now all peoples who bow not to the shadow in the east, by the gift of the Lord of the Mundberg, we will come to dwell in the land that he names Kalanadon, and therefore I vow in my own name, and on behalf of the Aetheod of the North, that between us and the great people of the West, there shall be friendship forever. Their enemies shall be our enemies, their need shall be our need, and whatsoever evil or threat or assault may come upon them, we will aid them to the utmost end of our strength. This vow shall descend to my heirs, all such as may come after me in our new land, and let them keep it in faith unbroken, lest a shadow fall upon them, and they become accursed. The two rulers then discussed the terms of the settlement. The Aetheod would have all of the lands between the Angren and the Adorn in the west, to the mouths of Entwash and the Emin Muil to the east, from the White Mountains in the south to Angrenos and the River Limlight to the north. Although it should be noted that Gondor retained command of Angrenos, aka Isengard. They would maintain their section of the Great Road that ran to Ariador in the north, and they would allow all friendly travellers to pass through unhindered. Finally, they would provide half of the maintenance to Amon Anwar, to make sure that the path to the summit was clear of blockage. During his lifetime, Aeol would be called the Lord of the Aetheod, or the King of Kalanadon, and the name of Rohan would not be used until the reign of his successor. Eventually, Aeol and Kirion were forced to take leave from each other. Aeol now had to undertake the task of bringing his people from the north to the lands of Kalanadon unscathed. He left half of his riders behind in Kalanadon to keep the land secure, whilst he travelled north of the other half. Although he was worried about this journey, it ended up being a success, and the Aetheod were brought to Kalanadon intact. They began settling the land, constructing their new capital in the Eastfold, a place called Aldberg. Kirion would return home, and would remove the tomb of Elendil to Minas Tirith, where Borondir would also receive a tomb of his own in honour of his deeds. The remainder of Kirion's reign would pass uneventfully, although war never truly ceased along Gondor's eastern borders. He would die in 2567, aged 118 years old, far outliving his father and grandfather. Aeol would spend his reign organising his realm, eventually choosing the site for a new capital, Edoras. However, Aeol would not live to see it completed. Easterlings invaded again in 2545, and although they were defeated, Aeol fell in battle in the Wald, where he had defeated the Balkov 35 years earlier. He was buried in the mounds outside of Edoras, and is considered to be the first king of Rohan. 
However, it must be said that the alliance between Gondor and Rohan was a diamond in the rough during this time. Throughout the rest of Middle-earth, Sauron's forces leapt into action, making life miserable for far more than the Gondorians and the Aethiod. One people in particular suffered their fair share of misfortune, and although it was not necessarily at Sauron's hands, it still played into his hands perfectly. The dwarves, after spending thousands of years in relative isolation, would now find themselves at the forefront of the events of the Third Age. But that's a story for the next episode. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. Like the War with the Wayne Riders, the Battle of the Field of Celebrant receives a lot of attention in the Unfinished Tales book, so definitely pick that up if you haven't. Expect the action to pick up a lot more as we approach the War of the Ring, so thank you, farewell, and remember, if you've ridden almost 1500 miles in the space of a month, maybe give yourself a break, don't ride into battle and die.